Welcome to Upper Tamar Reservoir, right on the Devon and Cornwall border. Now, this place is an absolute silverfish mecca. It's home to the renowned Feeder Masters Final 2, but we're not here for that. We're here for Battle Royale. Ringer versus Bennett, the final round of the series. It's 3-0 up to Steve Ringer overall, and he did beat Bagger on his so-called home ground at Western Pools. Can he make it 4-0? or will Bagger get one over on him? It's gonna be an epic battle, whatever happens. When I've spoke to my friends, obviously, um, I've told them, right, I'm off to Tamar, fishing against Ringer. Nobody really gives me a chance, I'll be honest. Um, they're just like, obviously, he's been down here for a week previous. He's tuned into the venue as much as he probably can get tuned in. Um, but hopefully I can prove them all wrong and I can uh, get one over on him. Taking Andy on anywhere is never going to be easy. People like sort of pigeonhole him as an F1 angler, he only goes to Partridge, but a good angler is a good angler wherever they go. So I know Andy's done a little bit of homework for this one. He's taking it a little bit more seriously. I think he feels like he's on a shot to nothing. So I feel like I've got everything to lose. Good morning, gentlemen. Morning. How are we Good feeling? Morning. Good. Welcome to the lovely Tamar. Excited? Yeah, I am actually, yeah. You've been here before, haven't you, Steve? I've been here before, but it's not always been my best friend. You've been here quite recently, though, as well. Feeder Masters final, but again, it could have done better. Well, you've actually both been here for a cheeky practice yesterday. Come and have a little look at you both. Did you enjoy it, catch a few? Yeah, it was good. It was um, more fish started to show later in the day, so hopefully. Right, right. What do you think, Steve? You've had him three times in the series and you beat him at Western before. You've got to be going into this one confident. Always confident, but like I feel like in the past I've had a bit of a shot to nothing. Whereas today I feel like I've got something to lose. So a little bit more pressure. Bagger, you're not renowned for doing this sort of fishing. I know you have done a bit in the past, but 3-0 down in the series, you've got to really beat him this time. Is it pressure on? No, not at all, because all the pressure is going to be on Steve. This is what he does. But, like, it's the opposite to Steve. I feel I've got a shot to nothing. I've got nothing to lose, although if I could win anyone, this would be the one I would win. Well, best luck to both of you. I've got two pegs in my hand. We've put one and two in up in the quarry section. It's the two pegs you both practised on yesterday. Steve, you were on one. Andy, you were on two. Any preference of pegs before the draw, dare I ask? I don't know. Steve caught a lot more than me yesterday on one, so I would maybe like there, but I caught well on the pole on two. I feel like if, I've, if I'm going to have any chance of winning, it's going to be on the pole, so I don't know really. Steve, any preference? I'd probably go for one because I've, it was good on feeder yesterday, but if I want to stop Andy, two would be better because I think two's a better pole peg, Right. Well, so I could slow Andy down by drawing two. They're both in here. I'm going to give Andy the first draw. Which one's up to? Which one? <laughs> no, kid, no, looking. <laughs> I think I've got two. two. I think it's the same. Yes. So we're on the same pegs. Same pegs as you practiced mm. on. Right, well, best of luck, folks. I cannot wait to see this battle. I'll Cheers. see you up there. Cheers. Cheers. Can't wait. I've got to be happy with the draw. I haven't fished it yesterday. I found a nice clear spot on the feeder. The only thing I'll say is the level's come up. A little bit more so I've had to sort of adjust my spot find a little clear spot in amongst the rocks but I'm really happy with my feeder line the pole line concerns me slightly because Andy caught really well last hour yesterday on the pole and my pole line's a little bit shallower but we'll see how it pans out yeah I'm reasonably happy with that draw I practiced that peg yesterday I felt like the peg were getting stronger as the day went on uh, a few skimmers was on my feeder line late even though it was a slow start um, and obviously my pole line got stronger towards the end of the day so yeah, I'm reasonably happy. I think Andy yesterday grew into the session, so to speak. I think he struggled a bit at the start, getting comfortable. He's not used to, obviously, sitting in the water, setting up platforms. But the last hour on that pole line, he looked really dangerous, and that's my big concern today. Steve catching well yesterday in practice, it does make you think you're missing a trick or two. And obviously, he hasn't just got one or two tricks, he's literally got dozens of tricks, and he's just doing little things all the time that, you know, I'm just too slow to react to sometimes, so yeah, it's a little bit intimidating because you just feel he's always one step ahead of you. Nerves-wise, I say, out of all the three we've fished so far, I'm more nervous today because I feel like I've got something to lose today. I never felt at Partridge, Makings or Wesson 
that anyone necessarily expected me to win. Yeah, I'd probably get close, but maybe not win. Whereas today, I feel like everyone's going to be like, well, of course, Ringo will hammer him at Tamar. It's what, what he does. So I've got everything to lose, and I feel like Andy's, there's no pressure on him for once. To kickstart my peg, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put six balls in on the pole. I'm going to fill this with particles, so micro pellets, casters, chop worm, and a few dead maggots. I'm initially going to try and lay a bed of ground bait down, loose feed over the top, try and drag some fish in. Then what I'm going to do is go straight onto the feeder, start on a four hole cage feeder, get some bait into the peg with probably micro pellets, chop worm, a little bit of ground bait, and then once I feel like the fish are in my peg, then what I'll do is cut back put a smaller feeder on and the plan from yesterday's practice was try and feed a little bit less bait and try and get bites a little bit quicker. Well we are set and ready we've got five hours on the clock. Bagger are you ready? I'm ready. Ringer? Born ready. All the very best gents let Val commence. One of the rules I've always stuck by with sort of match fishing is you feed the line you want to start on first. So when the match kicked off, I was a little bit surprised when Andy went to feed his pole first because that gave me a free run on the feeder. So I put three free old Guru 30 gram exchanges in the wide version, just with ground bait and pellets. Plenty of pellets, uh, quite wettish ground bait. I've put them in. And my theory being, if I can get some bait out there first, any skimmers that are hungry are going to come to me first while he's feeding his pole line. So I got those three in quick, and then I fed my pole line, and I felt like that gave me the fast start that Andy didn't have. An early change I made was, after feeding, I caught, I caught a skimmer literally first cast, smallish fish, eight, 10 ounce, but I'd had quite a few indications straight away, so I knew the fish were being pretty aggressive, coming to the bait, so I didn't want to waste time. I always believe in match fishing you've got to react quick to what the fish are telling you and those indications told me the fish were around the feeder the skimmers were coming to the bait so I switched to a four inch hook length straight away from 50 centimeters and I honestly think that was a massive plus for me because I reacted to how the fish wanted to feed and caught that little bit quicker as a result. Mix wise I used the same mix for pole and feeder it's a 50 50 mix of ringers f1 black and ringers dark Quite a fine mix, low food content, but loads and loads of attraction, which skimmers love.
I've had pretty much the perfect start, nice run of skimmers, but I'm very conscious of the fact they might not keep coming forever. So I need to keep my pole line topped up. I've been loose feeding it from the start. I've potted another ball in and I should keep it topped up and I should keep an eye on what Andy's doing as well. He'll be my sort of benchmark for the pole. But what I don't want to do this early is put all my eggs in one basket. Just think this feed is really easy. That goes to pot and then I've not got my backup line. So pole still my backup line and feed is my banker. Better to be lucky than good. To catch a three pound perch at Tamar is literally a huge bonus. There are loads in here, but I've never caught one before. So to get one early against Andy, it's given me a really good lead. One which I'm hoping to hang on to. People often say you need a bit of luck to get ahead in matches like this and Steve's definitely had it. Boys have been fish for fish for the first 20 minutes, then he's up something bigger. I've got a feeling it was one of the Tamar big perch that people talk about and it was, it looked to me approaching three pounds. So that's sort of the same weight as six of them skimmers the boys have been catching. So bagger, 20 minutes in, I'm gonna say three pound behind in one cast from Steve. Great little tip when skimmer fishing, and I'm experiencing it right now, is to butt rest it. Normally when you're skimmer fishing, I'd always have the rod on my knee, picking up on every indication, but today I've got a stack of skimmers in my swim at the minute, loads of fish there, I'm getting lots of taps and knocks, and if I hold the rod, I'm picking up on all the wrong indications, which is losing me time and costing me fish. So what I found today is the best way of doing it, butt rest it, so obviously front rest, back rest, butt rest it, so I'm not holding the rod, slacken right off, and only pick up when I know the fish is on. 
And when I say no, it's on, I'm looking for a constant indication that, that lasts that little bit longer. So I'm looking, and you think, as you think I need to pick up, I wait an extra second and think that's on, then I pick up, and literally, at the moment, I'm not missing a single bite. I'm happy with the way the match has started. I've, I've been catching a few fish on this feeder. One thing that's working for me is definitely putting particles in, but I've had a couple of chucks where, you know, I've not put any particles in and I've caught a fish quick too. So I'm just trying to work out the best way of feeding it. I want to make sure that, I, you know, don't go too negative, but at the moment I'm getting bites. I would say Steve's ahead just because he's had a bonus perch and he's probably two or three more skimmers than me as well. but. You know, as long as I don't fall too far behind, I'm quite happy. So yeah, fingers crossed, it stays like it is now. In the past, my go-to hook bait at Tamar has always been three dead red pinkies. I don't know why, but it just works. And today, it's proving to be no different. I had a good run on it at the start, and it's my number one hook bait now. I have tried a few other different hook baits, like a little bit of worm or two dead red maggots, but I keep going back to three pinkies. It's not let me down, and it just seems to be picking up them better stamp fish. It's not a big hook bait, but it's one that skimmers seem to love. Any cormorants where you are, Andy? Yeah, man, I'll just come on the pole because of it. It's literally gone here from a dancing tip to pretty much nothing in, what, 40 minutes due wow. to the... Mine what's saying, The mate. Black Death, as they call them. The problem is they're coming so close in. I know. I was getting a little run then, and then it's just sort of like fizzled. I've had an odd bite, but they just don't help, do they? No, I picked pole up and had two roach and a perch but problem the is, is we're the, skim only ones the skimmers are sitting in that deeper water we're the only ones here they're not nobody else to take them off us no hopefully they'll, they'll give us a break in 10 minutes i feel like there were more fish here today as well there's a lot of fish here at the start right from the off but now it's like i just think they've been sent all over the place that pole's not much better I've never seen Steve flustered, to be honest, but these birds are definitely winding up a little bit. Um, so yeah, this might be playing into my advantage because it's just sort of going over my head, but it is, I can tell it's really annoying Steve now. It's sort of killed that feeder line for him. These cormorants have come in and ruined, literally, my best skimmer peg I've ever had in my whole life. So fuming right now isn't the word. There's certain things in fishing that Anglers like Bennett and Steve have got loads of control over like the feeding, the way they put the rig in, but they've both just had some come in the peg that they can't do anything about and that's a big cormorant. And interestingly, it's gone down in Steve's peg and totally wrecked his swim. He's not had a bite for 18 minutes, he's just mentioned. Whereas Bagger, cormorant's gone down in his swim and he's just caught three and three casts. So it's definitely affected Steve, but not Bagger.
I went back on the feeder, there was an odd skimmer there, but it wasn't. It, they weren't settled, and there was nothing like what I had at the start. So I kept my ground bait slopped up, as in over wet. I wanted cloud. I'm a huge believer in if there's no fish in your swim, the biggest attraction as far as feeder fishing goes is cloud. So I kept it slopped up and I upped the micro pellets. In practice, I found micros led to bigger fish. So I kept up in the micro pellets and eventually it started to settle. It was nothing like what it was at the start, but the stamp was really good. And that was the important part for me. I could wait a little bit longer for bites, knowing that when I got a fish, it was a pound. And when they're a pound a piece, you don't need many for a big weight. When I'm wetting my ground bait up, I tend to work in a corner of the bowl. So I wet up one corner, achieve what, I, or try to achieve what I want to, and then if I want to switch it, I literally work from another corner or literally ditch the ground bait, the wet ground bait, go back to a normal mix. I don't have sort of two bowls. I tend to work from corners of the bowl. I might have four corners of the bowl, all with ground bait in a slightly different consistency, depending on what I want to achieve. and creeping out to you mate, I don't want to make too much noise. Now, third of the way through, you're on the pole and you've had a little run of fish on it, haven't you mate? Yeah, I've had a few roach and two skimmers, which is a good sign. Um, I don't think you can win with roach because you're not getting one every go in, but if them skimmers rock up, then you know, you've got potential that you could get a good run of them, but it's just making the decision now, like Steve's just had another there on the mm. feet. I don't want to waste too much time on it, but you have to sort of fish it. You know yourself, Matt, you've got to sort of fish in. Find like the fish are settled, get the feeding right. When you're fishing that feeder, you're sort of not doing it properly. You almost feel like you've got to be fishing the method to understand it properly, I know what you mean. What, um, any idea how you're doing against him at the minute? I'm definitely behind, he's had a big perch early. Yeah, I'm, I feel spawny, like isn't he? Yeah. He is spawny, so... Always get something like that, oh, he does. so lucky, but to be fair to him, the cormorant stick did kill his peg sort of just before mine. Mm, they did, to be fair, and yeah. And I managed to catch like three decent skimmers, but it's sort of like, it's so patchy on that feeder now, I can't really work it out. I feel like if I sit on that, Steve's going to have an advantage, so I'm hoping they'll come on this late, but, you know, if I sit here... There's That's one. a fish. Listen, mate, I'm going to leave you to it, because okay. I don't want to spend too much time in water while you're catching on this. No worries. Good luck. Keep putting one in net, mate. Cheers. So I dropped on that pole line halfway through and it started going under. All it was a case of doing is loose feeding them casters and all the time while I've been fishing the feeder I've been taking time out to just keep potting a little ball of ground bait with some worms, micros and casters in, odd dead maggot in it, hopefully attracting new fish into the peg all the time. Now I had the fish there, I was working out how they wanted it. Mr. Ringer. 
How's it going, mate? It started really well. Obviously, I got a little bit fortunate with a nice big footballer, yeah. Birch. I did, uh, I did give you a bit of stick about that. Yeah. I thought it was very, very spawny, sir. Half a log worm. I'm just twitching it back. Like it. Yeah. My style. Uh, no, and obviously the hook pulled as I went to net it as well, <laughs> so that was quite lucky. But then I had a really good run of skimmers. And to be fair, Andy was like saying, just that I'd got that perch, which is a two and a half pound perch, is like six, seven skimmers. Good lead, that, in yeah, it early doors. A, it doesn't sound, on a normal venue where there's lots of like three, four pound breeding, it's not a huge bonus, but when the average fish is probably 10 ounce, a two and a half pound fish is a big bonus. But then we, like the fish just got spooked a little bit, obviously by the cormorants, and Andy had like three or four better fish. And then since then, they're just a little bit spooky, they don't want to settle. I noticed like between you both, the cormorants did really affect it, but that's something that's totally out of control of you. So as a match angler, how do you feel when something like that happens and you stop catching because of something that you've got no authority over? Obviously it's, it's annoying, but all, I'm, all I've been trying to think is how am I going to get them to go back? So like, I've been trying to slop it up a little bit, having like three quick chucks, just to try and, try and like uh, amalgamate them again. Because I feel like I had them like nice and tight where I wanted them, um, catching steady, and then obviously they've gone all over the place. So I'm just like varying my chucking up to try and like get them back where I want to drag them back down. I've got to ask you, mate, I'm looking in your bowl now. Sloppy ground bait, some pellets and a few pinkies. Why, why so sloppy? A lot of just, people just wouldn't be, have it that sloppy. Because at the minute I don't feel like they're properly settled in my swim. I'm trying to like pull them all. And like when Andy went on the pole, I tried to chuck a bit more regular to try and like pull all the feeder fish. Right. And I think the best way of doing it is a bit of cloud. If I can get them like more fish into the swim, all I'll do then is, is uh, make it a little bit heavier. Got yeah. And then once I've got them, I can pin them. But so, the, minute, so the sloppy stuff clouds up in the water, brings them back in? Yeah, the sloppy stuff to attract them. And then hopefully, if I can attract a few, then I'll go to like a, I'll pl plug my feeder heavier, go to a dry mix, and then try and catch them. Can I take a bit of that and show Andy? No. Right, see you later. See you later. My setup for feeder fishing, bearing in mind I'm fishing at quite close range. Rod choice, 10 foot Steve Ringer Aventus, which is my own sort of signature range. Nice soft action, perfect for skimmers. Uh, three quarter ounce tip. Quite a soft tip, but I like to be able to read the bites. You know what I mean? Sit on my hands almost and wait for proper bites. Real choice, Aventus 4000, loaded with 008 pull shape braid. Braid, I think, is really important for skimmer fishing. It's low stretch, it helps to magnify the bites but also it helps to magnify in indications so I can read what's going on in the swim a lot better. Even if I'm not catching, I know when there's fish there. I then used a little one meter shocker of 10 pound shield, uh, fished a little running pattern oster for bite indication, as in registering bites nice and smooth and making them easier to hit. A running rig is miles superior for this type of fishing. So a little two inch guru feeder link. I like a short link as I feel it just makes the rig a little bit more positive. Then all I like to do is tie in a single strand of eight pound shield. So I've got my one meter shocker, just tie a single strand of eight pound shield in, about four inches in length with an overhand loop on, and that's what my hook length con connects to. Then the feeder runs down and just rests on that four turn water knot. So it's a nice simple setup, but the most important part is it doesn't tangle. On the subject of hook length, 50 centimeters of 014 pure to start, uh, size 14 pole special, for baits like worms, three pinkies, two dead reds, pole special is just a brilliant hook because it's got an extra long point. You find you, you never have a problem with a bait doubling over the hook like you can on other patterns. So that's my reason for the pole special. I've actually set two rods up. The, the setups are identical apart from one's 50 centimetres and one's for, got a four inch hook length. The reason for the two is the fish can come really close to the feeder at Tamar and if they do, 50 centimetres is too long. So I'll switch from 50 centimetres to four inch if those fish around the feeder and I'm getting myself indications that tell me they're there. My starting feeder choice is a 25 gram two hole slim line. It's quite an aerodynamic feeder so it aids accurate casting. Accuracy even at short range is really important. If you get a big wind on this sort of venue, because the slim line's bottom weighted, it helps to cut through the wind and just means I can be really accurate but at the same time, get the bait down nice and quick to where the skimmers are sitting. Although my starting feeder is the two hole slim line, depending on how the match progresses, I might end up switching to a window. The reason I'll switch to a window is if I feel like there's too much bait in the swim, as in the two hole slim line, because it's a cage, 
I might feel like it's releasing too much bait and the skimmers are going all over the place. If that's the case, I'll switch to a little small 20 gram window and I'll pack it really tight. The idea being then is get it down to the bottom, almost like a bomb. Then if I pack it tight, when the tip goes around and I hook the fish, it releases the bait then. So I haven't got loads of bait all around my hook bait. I only release the bait once the fish is hooked. Then it's simply a case of repeating the process with the window. Then if bites do go funny on the window, back to the cage to try and draw the fish back in. When it comes to loose feeding one thing that's really important is obviously not feeding beyond my pole tip I don't want fish sat beyond my pole tip that I can't get to so I'm trying to always feed this side of my pole tip if you imagine an imaginary line at 30 meters I don't want to cross it and then also I'm feeding quite heavy with the catty so I'm feeding 30 to 40 casters twice to make sure that I can get some bait down to the bottom when you lose feeding you're drawing new fish in but also you're creating a big area for the fish to graze over there's going to be a lot of fish in terms of little perch little roach there's going to be a lot of mouths down there at times so you've got to make sure that you attract new fish but also hold the fish that are in your peg well looking at andy from a tactical point of view one thing that is interesting is that he's definitely forced his pole line a lot more than steve has by that i mean potting in balls more regular, he's loose fed a lot more aggressive and I think that he believes that's the method he needs to use to beat Steve, he's catching odd skimmers on it now, some big roach and going into this latter part of the match, if Steve's feeder does slow down, I think he could overtake him you know. My bites have dried up on that pole line now, so what I'm going to do, I need to draw them fish back in. Obviously, I don't think they've gone very far, but the cormorants have definitely just spooked them a little bit. So, what I'm going to do is put in two loose pots of ground bait. Instead of balling it up, I'm going to put them in loose, and hopefully that will drag them fish in a little bit quicker than putting in balls where it might go past them and they don't see it. So, what I want to do is draw them in as fast as possible. So, I've put my particles in what I want to feed, micro pellets, worms, chop worms, casters and a few dead maggots, patted it in with my ground bait so then I've made like a little sand castle and I'm going to ship out there now, just pot in two loose pots, spread it over an area and then I'm going to be forced to go back on that feeder. Just as I got the skimmers settled for a second time, the cormorants came back. So again, I went from like thinking, easy lead, pulling away from Andy, to like, can't get a bite. But worse still, Andy started to catch a few skimmers. So all of a sudden, I'm sitting on a dead feeder's peg, and he's just starting to tick over with skimmers. And for the first time in the match, maybe starting to catch a little bit quicker than I was. So at this point, again, I felt like I've got to have a look on the pole myself. So a couple of feeders in on the feeder line, just in case that came back. 
and a quick look on the pole just to see if there's any skimmers in my peg. But my worry was the depth being that little bit shallower where I was, the skimmers wouldn't come in. So I was still going to need that feeder line. Tell you something, mate. After that start you had, I didn't expect to see you picking up the jam roll. No, they're just not settled again. What, on just, your feeder? Yeah, they're just not settling. I might have to go back on it. Because I just think my peg isn't going to live with Andy's on pole. Obviously, I've had one skimmer on it. He's probably had like seven or eight. What I want to ask you, mate, is how do you think you're doing against him at this point? We've got two hours left, pretty much. What do you think? I think I'm slightly ahead, but if it carries on the same thing, if it carries on the way it's going at the minute, he'll overtake me. Right, Unless right. I can get a run somewhere of skimmers. I just worry that being sort of like 18 inches shallower here on pole, I'm just not going to get the skimmers. I can hear a tone of worry in your voice, Steve. Are, are you worried? I'm not worried, search, because you can only do what you can do with your peg. You know, I mean, all I'm thinking at the minute is, I could do with the cormorants just to disappear for a couple of hours, mm. and if I can get a run on that feeder. I you might... did have them lined up this morning on that, mate. Oh, it was solid. It was, it was solid, and it's lined up with roach now. But I think that's because I'm in shallower water than Andy. And, or they might like the smell of my feet. They could they? Come to the smell. Do you know what I mean? If they do, go and stand behind him. <laughs> <laughs> but like, there's plenty of roach, but I'm not going to win catching roach. Right, got you. So I might put two or three big balls in on this. Go back on the feeder and then re-evaluate, say, with 90 minutes to go. I'm not one for giving tips, but yesterday I felt them skimmers came on Andy's pole when he were practising later on. Yeah, they did. they drifting a bit later. Yeah, I think they definitely do. I was just hoping they'd stay out today, but just because of the difference in depth between the two swims. Mm, got you. Uh, but they might still... I think, just think they'll come to Andy a little bit quicker because he's got more water. Are you catching pretty quick on that, mate? I'm going to leave you to it. All right, mate. Cheers, Good mate. luck, Mucker. Cheers, thank you. At the moment, the pole line's okay. There's a few roach there, some perch. So it's ticking me along, but there's no skimmers there. And Andy is getting an odd skimmer. So I feel like if I stay pole and he stays pole, he's gonna gradually eat into my lead. So although I am putting fish in the net and it's not all bad, I feel like to get the skimmers, I need to get back on that feeder line. So roach and perch are there. They're my sort of banker fish now. But if I can get them skimmers going, that's how I'm gonna win. I've got to say, from a watching point of view, this part of the match is mega interesting because both anglers have settled into the pegs now. Bagger's been priming that pole for three and a half hours or more and he's catching on it. And Ringer's flitting about quite a lot, but if I'm honest, it's too close to call. Bagger's little run of skimmers on a pole just now with Steve's really good early start. I don't know what's going to happen here. drop back in on this pole now late on it's actually starting to happen I'm starting to get a little pattern emerge if you like catch two or three fish and then I've got to top up with a little ball of ground bait obviously putting them particles in and then loose feeding over the top I'm just trying to work out the best way of catching them when I stop loose feeding it definitely doesn't seem to drag as many fish in potting just ground bait with some particles in it works for one fish but you can't seem to get a run off it you have to loose feed the only slight problem I'm having is when I'm loose feeding I'm starting to miss an odd bite as well as the skimmers are sort of coming up off the bottom. 
There's no, not many roach and perch there now. If I catch a perch, it's a telltale sign that I've got to refeed again. So, you know, I've probably had half an hour of this now. So looking at this last, probably just over an hour to go, what I'm hoping is that I can just settle in, get this feeding absolutely nailed. I feel like I'm catching Steve back up again now. So yeah, as it stands, the confidence is growing massively. At the moment, what I feared happening is starting to happen. Andy's starting to catch skimmers on the pole. I can't catch skimmers on the pole. I don't know whether it's a depth thing or I haven't got my feeding quite right, but equally, to make things worse, my feeder line isn't showing any signs of picking back up, whether it's because of the cormorants or whatever, but the skimmers aren't settling there anymore. So my worst nightmare at the minute is just starting to pan out a little bit. Is that a Jimmy Rimmer on the pole for Andy Bennett? It is, yeah. That's got this on a skimmer on pole, hasn't that? Now, Ringer, I think, I think he might have had one earlier. Yeah. You've had a few of these now, haven't you? Yeah, it's a bit deeper here. Um, Mate, that's not a skimmer, it's a bream. I was just going to say, they're a smaller stamp today, though. You reckon? Yeah, this, this is the stamp I was getting yesterday. I've had a few smaller ones, but I've caught half a dozen now, so it's a promising sign later in the match. I feel like this is the only way I can win. The feed is so inconsistent. I've been back on it, can't catch on it proper. And to be honest, when we was fishing it, Steve's just a lot better than me at it. He's just a bit quicker, he changes quicker. You know, I was keeping up with him, but I was, well, I was slowly falling behind on the feeder. Mate, I'm not gonna keep you for long, but what I am gonna say before I leave is I think you're in his head now. Yeah. I just had a chat with him. Definitely a tone of worry in his voice. He's on pole now, isn't he's he? He's on jam roll as well, yeah. yeah he is catching some roach, but is. I think your pole line is stronger than his. Keep it going, love. Cheers, See thank you. you. Cheers, Matthew. So during my best spell on the pole, the rig I actually used was a one gram version in carbon. And this is from our natural range. The shotting pattern was dead simple. I'll talk about that first. Just a simple bulk, olivet, half gram olivet. Trapped that in with some number nines. So locked it in position with nines either side of the olivet. And then they had quite big droppers, number nines again. So two number nine droppers below that. I actually spaced them apart, eight inches from my hook. 8 inches above that and then he had a gap of 9 inches from the middle dropper to the actual bulk itself. The reason for this is just so that it doesn't tangle as you're lowering your rig down sometimes. The main line was 015 N gauge, the hook length was 010 N gauge Pro and I finished that off with an 8 inch hook length and the hook I had on there was a 16's pole special and the elastic that I finished that off to was pink hydro elastic, very forgiving for skimmers but it's also got a bit of backbone as well for striking through the float and setting the hook.
I've got to say, I've absolutely loved watching that fishing match. Awesome performance from both, but your five hours is three, two, one, all out. Fish on. Yeah, I do enjoy fishing against Steve. I feel like it challenges me. Obviously, it's never going to be easy, but it sort of lets you know where you are. If I was getting absolutely hammered, I know I'd need to go away and work on my certain styles of my fishing more. But yeah, it's nice to be able to compete because he's been at the top of the game for the last 15, 20 years. So I know I'm literally right up there and I'm catching up. And yeah, it's just, I really enjoy fishing against Steve for these matches. My honest opinion is, with 30 minutes to go, I felt like I was smoking a cigar, so to speak. I was home and hose, couldn't be beat. Then that last 30 minutes has been really tough for me, both mentally and the fact that I was catching the odd little fish, ticking over, and Andy's catching skimmers, and it's impossible not to notice that. So for the first time maybe in the four fights, if you want to call them, I felt a little bit rattled. So if you ask me now which way's it gone, I'd say I might have just lost this one. Men. I don't normally like watching other people fish, but I've watched you pair several times now, and it is just an honour every time. All I can say is, please don't draw near me in a match. <laughs> I wouldn't want to take either of you on. How did you think it went, Andy? I think Steve got off to the better start. Um, I definitely had the better finish. Whether I've caught him up or not, I don't know, but it's been a good match. Awesome match. Steve, yourself? I think Andy pretty much summed it up. I think the first three hours were mine, so to speak. Obviously I had the big perch early, which got me ahead, and I think I stayed ahead. And even with the cormorants, I was still getting further ahead. But then that last two hours, well, definitely Andy's. The last hour in particular, he did some serious damage, and I think my luck might just have run out today. I don't know. It made for an awesome match. And I've got to say, I don't know the result myself. I feel a little bit nervous about it. Beautiful assistant, or Brandon. It's like being at the Oscars, this, isn't it? <laughs> Right. Don't look. I'm not looking. Here it goes. Wow. <laughs> you ready? Go on then. Steve Ringer, you weighed in today 46 pound and two ounces. Incredible performance. Andy Bennett, you weighed in today 40 four pounds and 14 ounces. Steve, you've done it again, mate. Well done. Absolutely incredible. You should both be really proud, honestly. From the bottom of my heart, and as a match angler myself, it's just an honor to watch it every time. Cheers, Matt. Loved it. Love the whole Cheers, series. Andrew. Folks, we call it Battle Royale. That's exactly what today has been. What an incredible fishing match. Beating Andy 4-0 is like amazing. Never would have ever thought that was possible and I don't think it'll ever be done again. But, and this is a big but, I'm realistic. I fish well and I feel like I've prepared a little bit, probably more than Andy and he'd, he'd say that. Every match has been ridiculously tight. Little things possibly gone my way a little bit and I've had an extra fish here and there. Literally looking at like makings, two fish, partridge ounces, Western pools, one good little 20 minute period. And then today, a big perch. So, 4 0 is 4 0, and I'll be crowing about it, but I'm equally aware I possibly could have gone 4 0 the other way. It's so hard fishing against Steve because he's, he's able to make decisions under pressure. And, like today, for example, I felt like I had him on the ropes and he dropped back in on the pole. Even though he's caught most of his fish on the feeder, he's dropped back on the pole and he's just made it impossible for me to beat him. He's just kept putting the fish in the net, which then adds pressure to me. and. I can't really do any more than what I'm doing, so yeah, it's disappointing to lose 4 0, but to be honest, he's just so hard to beat, so I'll take my hat off to him. One of the biggest things I've learned about Andy fishing against him over the four matches is his ice cold, as I call it, temperament. I've never fished against anyone who seems totally unfazed by anything his opponent does. So, it, loads of times I've been ahead of him and thought he's broke now. But you wouldn't know it, his body language is the same, he just goes on at the same pace. Nothing seems to phase him. I've never come across an angler with that temperament. A temperament like that is a massive edge to a match angler. 
and I can see now, having fished against him over four matches, why he's so good.